Thanks, Dwight. I told Dwight and Dale a moment ago what the pandemic didn't get, the cold weather did. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, we're grateful for all of you, and uh, I really thank God for opportunities like this where we can meet together, even though there are few of us and uh, in number, but we know that we are large in the eyes of God because we are here for that sole purpose of worshiping and glorifying our Father who is in heaven, who taught us to live by the golden rule. You know, the reason we call uh, this particular rule golden is because it is superb, and gold is the most precious of all metals. It is. But what is the golden rule that we read about in the Bible? That golden rule was taught by Christ who said that we are to do unto one another as we would have them do unto us. And that entails a number of things. I want to share with you tonight some things that I really believe are significant and important to fulfilling that particular rule of Almighty God. And this particular rule, by the way, the one we call golden rule, involves and actually undergirds many of the great things and rules that we read about uh, not only in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament as well. When I think about the golden rule, I'm reminded in reading the Bible that it is careful in its judgment of other people. You know, we have a, a keen way sometimes of judging other people. We judge them by the way they talk, if they talk with a different dialect or a brogue. Uh, we judge them by... Uh, maybe the clothes they wear. We judge them by the color of their skin. We judge them by their uh, status financially. Uh, we judge them in so many, many ways. And yet the Bible actually teaches us that sometimes the judgment that we impose upon other people is harsh and unkind. And it's kind of like the uh, kettle calling the pot black, isn't it? And uh, none of us want to be on the scales of judgment because we're fearful sometimes that we might fail. In the book of Matthew 7, however, verse 1 through 5, Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider that big plank or that log that is protruding from your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Jesus just simply says, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly uh, to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, Christ is not actually condemning judgment in this text. And a lot of times we use this text to prove a point uh, that we shouldn't be judging one another. And I believe that sometimes our judging is unrighteous. But I think there is a righteous judgment that we read about in the Bible. But the golden rule does not embrace hypocritical judgment. And that is what Christ is talking about here. Uh, the man whose sin is much, much worse than the one who is criticizing. And we all have a tendency sometimes to criti criticize one another or to say things about other people when in reality we are guilty perhaps even more. It's like a man said to me one time, he said, you know, when you point a finger at someone else and point out their flaws, you have three fingers that are pointing back at you. And that is the way it is in life, isn't it? And so we have to be extremely careful and cautious in our judgment of other people. And what I'm talking about is unrighteous judgment of others. There is no basis for our judgment of other people. And judging others does not define who they are, but actually it defines who we are. It defined that man that Jesus spoke about in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7. 
uh, when Jesus actually called him a hypocrite because in reality he allowed in his life the very things that he would condemn in the life of another individual. I'm reminded of a passage that Paul writes to the Galatian brethren, and this principle is so true in life. For in Galatians 6 and verse 7, Paul writes, so he says, whatever you sow, you will reap. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the world, you'll reap the world. But if you sow to life and to righteousness, you will reap the righteousness of God. And so judging is commanded in some sense. If you go back to that text, God did not condemn that man for judging, but he condemned him for being a hypocrite. He condemned him for his judgment of another person when he was even worse than the one that he was condemning. You know, the scales of judgment are so important. Uh, in the Old Testament, we were told that we were to judge the prophets, and they were also, as to whether or not they were a false prophet or not. And Jesus, even in the book of Matthew chapter 7, told us to judge the prophets. He said, many false prophets have gone out into the world and thereby shall deceive many. If you didn't practice judgment, you would never be able to know who was a true prophet of God or who uh, was a fake prophet or one who was false. Beware of false prophets, he says, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The answer to that is an obvious and it really was a rhetorical question that was asked by Christ. We have to judge in terms of civil government. That's why we have courthouses. And uh, our courthouse here in, in Anderson County is a very beautiful facility. And we have, have courthouses in every county in the state of Texas. And the reason we do that is that we have to make judgments. A judge will make a judgment or a jury of your peers will make that judgment. And God even sanctioned it in the book of Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 7. If you're going to reprove someone, and Paul says that we're to do that in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, he says to preach the word of God, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, how do you know? If, you don't, if you're going to reprove and rebuke, it requires judgment, doesn't it? Well, we judge every day various things in life. We have to judge between that which is right and that which is wrong. Psalm 119, verse 128. But what is the judging that Christ actually prohibits? Hypocritical judgment. You make sure that your own backyard is clean. You make sure that your heart is right, even when you're judging other people. Someone said, don't put your foot on the scale if you're judging another person. Christ condemned judgment that was unfair and unmerciful and harsh judgment. And sometimes we're all guilty of judging in that fashion or imputing unworthy and sinister motives to other people. You know, sometimes you can look at another person and you think, well, there's some reason for him doing that. You know, people do that when people do nice things for him. You know, uh, they say, well, I wonder what he's up to or I wonder what she's up to. I mean, why did you do all this? There must be some kind of ulterior motive for you doing this. Can't people just do those nice little serendipity things just to be nice out of the clear blue? Sure they can. We have to get all the facts before we judge one another. That's embraced in what we call the golden rule. In John, the seventh chapter in verse 24, the Bible says we're not to judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. 
Get all the facts that you can. That's why in a court of law, they don't just base it on hearsay. That's not allowed in the courtroom. You have to be a witness to a crime. You can't say, well, I talked to a fellow who told me who this happened. and That doesn't work. And it doesn't work with Almighty God either. In the book of Proverbs 18 and 17, King Solomon said, The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. What he's saying is don't you be guilty of judging based on hearsay. And sometimes we do that. Someone can say something about someone else and we base our judgment upon what that person says instead of assimilating all of the factual information. Jesus in his day often said this. If you were to go through the Gospels, you would find Christ making this statement many, many times. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. You know, we all listen to hearsay all day long, don't we? That doesn't mean you're going to use it against an individual. It doesn't mean that you're going to judge that individual unfairly, but you're going to get all the facts together. Uh, someone said, don't judge me if your blood can't wash away my sin. You know what? That's a pretty good thing, isn't it? And there's only one who can take away our sin, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But there are some people who claim to be know-it-alls. You ever been around people like that? I mean, they think they know it all. They have all the answers to life. But don't judge one another based upon what other people say about them, but practice the golden rule. And judge based upon that substantial information that is available to us. And at all times, use love when you're judging one another. Let me tell you why that is so true and why mercy is so true and so important is because God loves us and God is merciful unto us. One time there was a publican who made that known when he went along with the Pharisee up to the temple to pray and the Pharisee began to extol his virtues and talk about how wonderful he was and God didn't really have a lot of respect for that at all because he knew that he was hypocritical. But to the publican who would smite upon his chest and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible says that man went down to his house justified. I saw this little slide several years ago, and I incorporated it in this lesson because I think it's true. Uh, you know, many of us gossip and we say bad things about other people that we ought not to say. And if they were giving an Emmy, and by the way, I saw the governor up in uh, New York got an Emmy uh, for his daily briefings about the coronavirus. And uh, I'm not sure how you feel about that, so I won't comment about it. I just brought it up. You be the judge. <laughs> but anyway, if they were giving awards for those who gossiped, and you know what? Every church has gossips. This church has gossips. But I'm not calling names. But I'm telling you, sometimes there are some people in this church that are bureaus of information. And a lot of people in this church know who they are, believe it or not. That's not judging, that's fact. There are those who are all mouth, and many times they have nothing of real consequence to say. That's why you have to be very, very careful Sometimes we just need to zip our lips together and refuse to say something when we are tempted to do it. Some people can't wait to hear the latest gossip. I have been around people like that. I'm not interested in gossiping about people. Uh, if I can help someone, I want to help them. And, uh, but, you know, I'm not interested in gossip. I've even heard people gossip in their prayers. I'll never forget several years ago, we had someone up there praying, and, we, and he was praying, and he was saying, God, please bless this family. You know, they're going through divorce. No one knew about them going through a divorce. But it was their way of gossiping. God, please bless this family because they're going through a horrible divorce right now. And after the prayer was over, everybody looked up and kind of looked at each other like, boy, I didn't know this. 
You know, God doesn't need that kind of information anyway. He already has it. You don't hide from God. He knows all about it. But there are some people <laughs> who will talk to you, but they will also talk about you. You better be careful who you talk to and practice the golden rule at all times. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. But there's a second thing about this golden rule that is so important. Treat others with respect. You know, even though you have disagreements and even though you don't agree with each other, you treat one another with respect. I think, you know, you don't hit them over the head and you don't browbeat them and, you know... I've never taken that opportunity, even as a preacher of the gospel. And I have a lot of good preacher brethren. And they get up every Sunday morning and rake the church up and down one side and down the other. You know what? We have to be people who recognize that we're all sinners. Didn't Jesus say that in the book of John 8 about the woman that was taken in adultery outside the city? And he challenged those who were accusers. And he said, let any of you who have not sinned, cast the first stone. And every one of them walked away. Every one of them. There was no question about who they were and what they had done as well. But we have to be very careful. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. You know what? The world would be a better place if people just practice that one rule. I mean, really, we could eliminate law. Uh, <laughs> I won't say defund the police, but I mean, we can eliminate laws if people live by that one law. You treat other people the way you want to be treated, and you treat them with respect. When judging others, there's something we should all remember in life. Nobody's perfect. Nobody deserves to be perfect nobody has it easy everybody believe it or not in this congregation has issues you never know what people are going through while you're judging them so pause before you start judging and criticizing or mocking others everybody is fighting their own battle in life and while you were busy judging others, you left your closet door open and a lot of skeletons fell out. I don't know that anybody would want to open their closet door to you, to your sins. The golden rule, so very, very important. And that's why Christ gave that rule. And whatever is hateful to you, don't you know that that's going to be distasteful to your fellow man. But thirdly, treat others with love above all. The Bible, Peter said, above all things, put on charity. Against such there is no law. Paul said the same thing in the book of Galatians. You treat other people with love. You know why? That's what Christ did. He walked in love. And John says that if we're going to follow him, we must walk in love. And we must love with a pure heart fervently, the word of God says. Every moment in our lives, every moment that we live upon the face of this earth should be filled with love for other people. And I can tell you why I say that is because if God loved those people, then I have to love them. Do you know, you even love your enemies, <laughs> He, and Jesus said, if you go back to this again, he said, you have heard it said, love those who do good to you and hate those who do not do good to you. In Matthew 5, verse 44 and 45, he says, love your enemies and pray for them that despitefully use you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely. For my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. You treat other people like you want to be treated. That is the golden rule. You treat them in a nice and kind way. 
It's not a sacrifice that we make to do that. But in reality, it is an investment that you make in other people. The golden rule does not say, and I want you to notice this. We were talking this morning in our Bible class about baptism, things that baptism will not do. Well, the golden rule does not say do unto others as they do unto you. And a lot of people live by that rule. If they do this to me, I'll, I'll treat them the same way that they treat me. God didn't say that. Or do unto others before they do it unto you. Didn't say that. He didn't say do unto others when they do unto you. He didn't say do unto some others as you would have them do unto you. But he says we treat all people in the same way. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And if it is the law, if it is what God says then I'm convinced that we ought to be doing it. It is a very personal thing. He uses the word you. And then he uses the word do. That's an action word, isn't it? It means that we have to be active in what we do. It's not a theory. It's not a philosophy. It's not just trying to get along with everybody, but you're trying to do the right thing. You want to get along with God. It's something that you apply to do, to act out in your life. You've heard it said of those of old time that you shall not murder, and whosoever murders will be guilty and in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry, consider this, folks, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever that says to his brother, Raka, it's that word that's kind of like the word fool there in the original text, and it means that you're worthless. That's really what it means. But you're not worthless. If Jesus died for your sins, you are worth every drop of his blood. But you shall be in danger of the council if you say that. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Now Christ said that, folks, and that's why we have to be very, very careful about what we say. You have heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you to love your enemies. Tough thing, isn't it? It's one of the great and tough commandments of Almighty God. Bless those. Bless those who curse you. And do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and even persecute you. Young man came to Jesus one time. And he asked Christ, what is the great commandment of all? And Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Matthew 22, Luke's account of the gospel said, uses the word strength also. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor, notice this, as yourself. You treat other people as you want people to treat you, but you love your neighbor. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. For on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then in Romans 12, Paul says, repay no one evil for evil. Boy, isn't that something? We like to get back. We don't want to get even. We want to get ahead. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. You make every effort to practice that golden rule in every dimension of your life, whether it's school, whether it's work, whether it's church, whether it's in the community, whether it's with your neighbor geographically. For God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And if your enemy is hungry, notice what he says, feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with that which is good.
Whatever you want people to do unto you and the way you want people to treat you, you start treating them that way. And it's something you ought to start. If you're not doing that, you need to start practicing it. Where is the golden rule needed most? In our homes. Boy, <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful in our homes if we had the people that practice that golden rule? Think before you speak. Think before you act. Be careful. Let's make our home Christian. The golden rule is needed at the workplace. It might surprise you how much better you'd get along with your peers at work if you really practiced the golden rule and you were nice to people. Kids need it at school. Sometimes kids are bullies, and we hear a lot about that. How uh, bullying is a big thing in a lot of schools today. We need it in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, many people don't even know who their neighbors are. If I were to ask you, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, do you know who your neighbors are? Uh, do you? How far does that go in your neighborhood? We need the golden rule in the church, down at the church house, don't we? And we need it with the lost. And if other people were ready to follow your example, your family, your friends, where would you be leading them? Where would you be leading them? We are to walk worthy of the vocation to which we have been called, Paul says. And just where are you leading them? Will they learn the golden rule from you? That's significant, isn't it? If you want others to be Christian examples, shouldn't you be one as well? And if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you can't be the right example. That's why it's so important that this is something that we practice in our life. It gets back to the fact that you want to let your light shine. You want to be the salt of the earth, as old saying goes, and as Christ taught in the book of Matthew chapter 5, then you start being the salt of the earth. Start being a light to those who walk in darkness. It'll change your life this week, and I mean that sincerely. I hope you'll practice it. Uh, I didn't just get up here to speak for 30 minutes, but to challenge you this week to treat other people the way that you want to be treated. And uh, maybe you failed in that area, and if you have, and you want us to pray for you tonight, we're happy to do that. We're happy to baptize you into Christ should you want to give your life to him while we stand and while we sing.